Truth Driven Thinking number 92, The Accidental Atheist, How I Got Here and How You Can Help, an Appeal for Mercy. Hi, my name is Stephen L. Gibson, and there came a point in my life where I held a troubling, dark secret. I had been in the closet after a profound shift had occurred inside my brain. And if I admitted it out loud, it would be upsetting to many people, certainly unnerving to me. And perhaps to others, the ultimate heresy utterable by an apple pie, relatively wholesome, community-minded, red-blooded Methodist young man from the Midwest. You see, I had stopped believing in God. This audio program of The Accidental Atheist, How I Got Here and How You Can Help, is my attempt to explain what happened, with three prominent thinkers and theologians actually doing most of the talking via interviews that I conducted some years ago on my journey. These guests include Bishop John Shelby Spong, Dr. Robert M. Price, and Tom Harper. In addition, we have Dr. David Sloan Wilson, an evolutionary biologist who educated me about his challenges to the famous new atheists of the day, whom he says are sorely misguided in many of their criticisms of religion. Not because they're wrong about God, but they're wrong that there is not value in religion. So in part, this program is about an attempt to show a bit about how I got here to my non-theistic humanist worldview. But it's much more than that. Regardless of your beliefs, my hope is that you'll find it interesting and useful. If you're a Christian believer and you think I've made a horrible mistake, perhaps you can better understand how and why it happened and thus gain a couple of benefits. First, maybe through better understanding you can prevent this from happening to others. Maybe. More importantly, you will see that however innocently I got here, I still carry with me the fundamental values and goals of the Golden Rule, doing no harm to anyone, and leaving the world better than I found it. You see, it's through mutual understanding that tolerance and peace are born. Those are wishes that I believe most loving people share. But all too often today we divide ourselves, we label the other group and escalate conflict. I understand and respect your worldview. Perhaps today you can try to do the same for me, even if it's to try to save others like me, that's fine. On the other hand, if you're a non-believer hearing my story, perhaps you will find comfort in a shared experience and knowing that you're not alone. So to this day, believers wonder how I got here and why. Again, the truth is that I certainly didn't choose to be here in any conscious sense. If anything, there was a real sadness that surrounded my transition away from belief in any definable, knowable, supernatural, personal God. After all, to a large degree, I was disappointing my friends, community, my church, and my family. The greatest, kindest, most loving people I had known were Christian. And while I wasn't saying that they still weren't those things, I also knew very well that they might think my rejection of God was also a rejection of them. Hardwired from birth as a people pleaser, I most certainly did not want to hurt anyone or appear mean-spirited or attack anyone's faith. I also wasn't bitter or angry. I didn't blame God for the loss of my parents at an early age or any other tragedies. To the contrary, I believed at the time that my strong faith supported me through those hard times and helped me to better cope, as I fictionally portrayed in the early chapters of my novel, A Secret of the Universe. It's worth saying it again, I did not choose this path. Who would choose to upset their world, upset others, or potentially disturb a solid reputation or their business? Where I come from, Christianity is a big plus to business in most circles. Atheism, not so much. Or who would risk drawing down personal goodwill or clout in the community in such a controversial way, too? 
Poll after poll shows that atheists are viewed as occupying the social strata somewhere beneath the scum layer at the bottom of the American melting pot. What self-respecting, loving, caring person with a family would choose to become an atheist unless forced with a situation where it seemed immoral and, and inauthentic to do otherwise regardless of the costs? I mean, the first George Bush, President of the United States, was on record saying, No, I don't know that atheists should be considered as citizens, nor should they be considered patriots. This is one nation under God, end quote. However misguided in his understanding of the Constitution and beliefs of the Founding Fathers like Washington, Jefferson, and Franklin, who would choose to wander so far from the Bushes that he voted for and supported, and from the people that he loved? I should also note that I was not trying to rebel or get away with anything. I assume it's true that some people do hide from their faith as a way to rationalize their opening of a window to some behavior that the church or dogma forbid, but that was not me. Certainly at the time of this transition, almost a decade ago now, I was about as nerdy and pretty much uh, straight-laced as anyone I had ever known. Certainly not perfect by any stretch, but genuinely pretty straight and narrow. Besides, I now know that humans are quite capable of rationalizing just about anything they want to do while still retaining their faith. If I merely wanted to get laid or something, I surely could have done that and stayed in the church, as many people do every day. We see it all the time in pews and even in pulpits. In fact, the story of a woman wanting to have sex with someone because God told her to do it and that it was right or encouraged it is probably not a rationalization that only I have witnessed. And it certainly would have been much easier than going public as an atheist. So I wasn't angry at God. I wasn't bitter. I didn't want to risk upheaval in my friendships and family. I wasn't trying to get away with something. Other than my views on sexual ethics, perhaps, my morals and standards of conduct have not changed and include doing only that which is good for me and others, both in the long and the short run. But the question remains, how did I get here? Before I answer that question, I'd like to revisit a little bit why it matters. I mean, what's even the point of producing this little collection of audio interviews? Am I trying to deconvert people? Am I a mere evangelist of atheism at this point, an adherent to a new faith, but one that's just as blind to my own preconceived assumptions as those who are religious? Is it just a different kind of evangelicalism or evangelism that's my goal? Well, you'll certainly hear those questions addressed with my guests, uh, which I mentioned include three acclaimed former pastors, but the answer is no, not really. The purpose of this program is not centered on the idea of deconverting anyone. Yes, I admit that I think a naturalistic worldview is not only more satisfying to many people like me than one that pretends to understand the supernatural, unknowable mind of what I now view as a very human construct of the axial age. And yes, that worldview seems a better tool for understanding the real world to me and improving it in reliable ways and embracing the beauty and the mystery of our humanity. But that's another book. That's my earlier book. Bias aside, the point here is that deconversion is not my goal. My goal is understanding, because it is of understanding that genuine peace and tolerance can flow. Having been a moderate but true believing Christian my whole life and trying very hard to be a good one, including recommitting a few times at rock concerts and altar calls, I think that I fully understand the beliefs of many of my believing friends. My guests probably do even better. But of course, we should understand them, because we once were them. I felt God touch me personally after the death of my father. I believed deeply. I understood the apologetics. I read the books. 
I got the narrative. What I seek to do with this audio montage is to help you to gain a sliver of understanding about how I got to non-theism and that I did not willingly come here. I did not get here because I am infirm, I am not ignorant of the Bible, I'm not angry or wishing to embrace new moral laws to rationalize some dark desire. While those may indeed be paths taken by others to non-belief, they were not my path. Extraordinary evidence was my reluctant path, as I believe it also was for at least one of the guests you're going to hear from. There are related paths born of intellectual commitment to one's faith that commonly do lead to non-belief, or at least agnosticism, which is simply admitting to being unable to have the knowledge to answer the question. New Testament scholar Dr. Bart Ehrman, for instance, admits his own diligent journey to know his God better through Wheaton College, through Moody Bible Institute, then Princeton Theological Seminary, culminated in his agnosticism due heavily to the problem of human suffering, also called theodicy. This is also known as the problem of evil, which Epicurus famously put this way. He said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? So though Ehrman's path to non-belief is yet another, it is not exactly mine. It was still most certainly arrived at intellectually, arising out of a legitimate moral judgment against a God who would create such a suffering-laden petri dish for his entertainment or our supposed edification. But you get the point. There are many paths. Still, none of these was mine, the one you're going to hear about in this program. My path to atheism was mostly about what is called historical criticism. The more I learned, the less I knew. The historical case for liberal interpretations of virgin births, dying and rising saviors, talking donkeys, miracles, and other difficult to believe stories from ancient people, as you're about to hear, are not simply implausible because these things violate the known laws of nature. It's the culture and history the historical uncovering of interpretive mythology, the evolving zeitgeists, and the cross-pollination of various beliefs that both long preceded Christianity and even succeeded it for the first centuries. It's all that that overwhelmed me once I understood more about them. In some ways, I found much deeper meaning in the traditions under which I was raised, which was ironic to me. So as we move to the interviews, I just ask two things of you. One, please make an attempt to understand me, and thus not to reject me as unworthy of being loved, of your love, of trust or kindness. Certainly do not hate me. I would actually argue that to do so merely because of a path I arrived at reluctantly but honestly is itself perhaps intellectually dishonest, certainly not good for the world, and not good for you. It's my hope that through my story and the brief insights provided by these interviews, you will at least say, Stephen, you are so wrong, but I see how you got there and know you're not a bad person simply by virtue of your intellectually honest conclusions about whether or not there is a God or whether or not humans can know and define it. Then secondly, I ask, that you love me anyway, despite my lack of belief in God. That's it. My goal as a naturalist and humanist, by the way, is to love you as well. If God is love, perhaps we can find common experience there and even relish in it, even if we cannot find common dogma, symbolism, or language to describe it. Through the golden rule, I really believe the world can be better but peace and love must begin with understanding, with placing yourself in the shoes of someone with whom you disagree and seeing how and why they got there. I thank you very much for your attempt to understand me and love me. 
Very quickly about the interviews. You're about to hear an edited collection of excerpts from interviews I conducted very shortly after I came out of the closet and admitted my non-belief quite publicly because I felt I had to. In fact, you can still find my original communication to family and friends on my website at truthdriventhinking.com. It's called Coming Out in the Interest of Authenticity. If you Google that and my name Stephen L. Gibson with a PH in the Stephen, uh, you'll certainly find it. Now, in the interest of time and downloads, this program's broken into two parts, roughly one hour for the first part and 90 minutes for part two. I also want to plug two ways you can hear more from these individuals and from many others. Due to time constraints, you'll be hearing perhaps less than half of the original interview content, and much of that was equally profound and educational, quite honestly, including to Christian believers who listened to it. So you can hear the original interviews in their entirety and many others at Truth dot bloomfire.com that is a social learning community where you can support what i sometimes refer to as my own calling to a mission to minister to people of all faiths and certainly to those of no faith in the supernatural and to also helping improve the world through truth seeking a negligible donation enables access to peer exchanges a free copy of my novel uh, webcam posts that you can make perks and a broad array of programming surrounding the search for ever-elusive truth. So again, truth.bloomfire.com, and you can listen to the extended interviews from these interesting individuals. You can also find other free interviews with fascinating guests on a variety of topics via my podcast at truthdriventhinking.com. The following excerpts contain introductions of our guests so we're going to let the tape speak for itself. I will only add that these people helped change my life profoundly and for the better. So I again express my gratitude to them. They helped me grow and Bishop John Shelby Spong even allowed me to recast my most memorable conversation with him into a conversation in my novel. It is with him, a man for whom my respect and appreciation cannot be overstated, that we begin our conversation. John Shelby Spawn was the Episcopal Bishop of Newark, New Jersey for more than 20 years and is one of the leading spokespersons in the world for an open, scholarly, and progressive Christianity. Bishop Spong has taught at Harvard at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He obviously lectures extensively throughout North America, Europe, Asia, uh, the world, let's just say it that way, and has appeared on many of the network television programs. He is the author of 15 books, including the best-selling Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism, Living in Sin, Liberating the Gospels, and Why Christianity Must Change or Die. His current book is The Sins of Scripture. Many believe that uh, history is going to recognize Reverend Spong as one of the major change agents in modern Christianity, and we are delighted to have with us Reverend John Shelby Spong. Well, I think the, the place where you have to start is to recognize that there's a difference between saying something is not so and something is mythologically presented. Uh, for example, the story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem is probably not history. It was terribly important to the Jews who were who were trying to understand Jesus in terms of all of their messianic expectations to portray him as having been born in the the birthplace of King David because part of the messianic expectation was that he would be of the house of David and would restore the throne of David. But if you look at Mark's gospel, it's very, and that's the first one to be written, it's very clear that Jesus was born in Nazareth. He, he's called a Galilean, he's called a Nazarene. Uh, Galilee and Nazareth are his place of origin. And when you get to the two stories that suggest he was born in Bethlehem, you find deep contradictions. Matthew, the first one, believes that Jesus and his mother and father live in a house in Bethlehem. and then he, But he's got to deal with the other part of the tradition that says that Jesus has got to be called a Galilean, so he's got to come from Galilee. So Matthew has the problem of getting him out of Bethlehem where he's born and into Galilee where he clearly grows up. Matthew, on the, I mean Luke, on the other hand, believes that he lives in Nazareth, 
But Luke knows the tradition that the son of David has to be born in David's city, so he has to develop a tradition that gets the Holy Family out of Nazareth and down into Bethlehem so he can be born there, and that's when you get the story of the census. Now, most biblical scholars know that none of that is history. The uh, the story of in Luke's Gospel that the reason they had to go to Bethlehem was that a census had been ordered and everybody had to go to their uh, home, to their original uh, family history place. Well, there are something like 40 generations between King David and and Joseph, do you have any idea how many 40 generations would be when you direct descendants? You know, uh, David had lots of wives. His son Solomon had a thousand wives. We don't know how many children David had, but it was a goodly number. And if those produced for 40 generations, you're getting up close to a billion people just with geometric progression. And the idea that, that anybody in that period of time would know enough about uh, family records to keep 40 generations alive. We can't even do that today. <laughs> so they'd all go back to Bethlehem. That's just clearly not history. The second thing you know that we know from secular records is that Quirinius became governor of Syria in the year 7 AD. Uh, now, if Jesus was born when Herod was the king, which both Matthew and Luke assert, he would have been born around 4 B.C., so he'd be 10 or 11 years old by the time Quirinius became governor of Syria. So the, the story begins to fall apart in a lot of places. I think the final place that uh, makes it kind of fun to think about, uh, Luke's story says that Joseph takes Mary, his wife, who is, quote, great with child, as King James Version, which would at least mean eight to nine months pregnant, it seems to me, that he took her on this journey up to Bethlehem. Well, the only way, it's 94 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The only way you could get there is either by walking or riding on a donkey. And there are no hotels and there are no restaurants, and no man in his right mind would take an eight to nine months pregnant woman on a 94-mile donkey ride uh, in that sort of circumstance. So that everything about these stories cries out to say we're not dealing with history, we're dealing with an interpretive mythology and interpretive mythologies do not mean it's wrong. It just means it's not literal. It was terribly important to the early Christian community to establish Jesus as messianic. And so being born in Bethlehem was a, was a great big part of that. And they identify this experience with the ultimate God, and they met this experience in a man named Jesus of Nazareth. So they had to develop a mythology that showed how this God that they portrayed as some supernatural a parent figure who lived above the sky, how this God got into Jesus. And that's where you get the virgin birth. And it's not original to the Christian story. The virgin birth doesn't develop until the ninth decade. Uh, there's no virgin birth in Paul, who wrote from 50 to 64. There's no virgin birth in Mark, who wrote in the early 70s. The virgin birth story is introduced in the mid-80s by Luke, I mean by Matthew, and it is added to by Luke in the late 80s or maybe even the early 90s, and then it's totally omitted from the fourth gospel, John who on two occasions refers to Jesus simply as the son of Joseph. Now, if you say that to people, you say, oh my goodness, I never heard that. <laughs> because we've been saying the Christian creed forever, which says, born of the, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. So we think that's part and parcel of what the Christian story is all about. And it's interesting to know that of the five major writers in the New Testament, three of them either don't know anything about the virgin birth or deny the virgin birth. And they would be Paul and Mark and John. And only two of them, Matthew and Luke, tell the miraculous birth story. And they disagree on so many details that they, it's hard to reconcile. We reconcile Matthew and Luke only when we do Christmas pageants. And we do Christmas pageants by following the Luke storyline and then tacking Matthew's wise men on as the final scene. But the stories are deeply incompatible. Uh, Matthew's story has Jesus and Mary and Joseph fleeing down into Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod, who's coming down to kill all the Jewish boy babies, which is nothing but a Moses story being retold about Jesus. But at the same time, Luke says that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day and presented in the temple in Jerusalem on the 40th day, and then they leisurely made their way back to uh, Nazareth from whence they had come. The stories can't be reconciled. Now, that's just one tiny little illustration. Uh, we, could, we could go on through the stories of the Gospels and see that time after time we're dealing with interpretive material and not with literal history. But unfortunately, uh, 
the New Testament, which is written by Jews in a Jewish context, was read and interpreted by Gentiles from about 125 A.D. until oh, toward the end of the 20th century, when we finally began to recover our Jewish eyes. You know, and then you see the Bible in a very different way, the Gospels in a very different way. What I mean by Midrash is that the Jewish people told stories about their heroes and kept telling the same story about different heroes. And their understanding was not that this was not true. Their understanding was that they had met God in Moses, they met God in Elijah, they met God in a number of people. And so the way they indicated that it was the same God was they told the same stories about these people. The best one, the one that people would be most familiar with, is the fact that uh, that that the, the big story about Moses was the Red Sea splitting. He split the waters and allowed the Jewish people to go through on dry land. What we're not familiar with is that Joshua did the same thing at the Jordan River when they got, went into the Promised Land, that Elijah does the same thing when he goes out into the wilderness to depart from this world. Elisha does the same thing when he comes back. And in some sense, Jesus, when he is being baptized, goes into the Jordan River that has been split three times by three heroes of the past. But Jesus doesn't split the Jordan River because that's sort of anybody can do that. That's been done so often. <laughs> He's portrayed as splitting the heavenly water, splitting the heaven so that the Spirit, which pours down upon him and spirit and living water in the Jewish tradition are always synonymous. That, so that what, what we're being told here is a story. It's not a literal story at all. It's an attempt to see in Jesus the new Moses, the new Elijah, the new Elisha, the new Joshua. And so these stories are wrapped around over and over and over again. But we read the Gospels and we sort of say, well, I've only got two alternatives. I've got to take it literally and then I become a fundamentalist, or I've got to dismiss it as impossible, and then I become a member of what I call the Church Alumni Association. <laughs> the best way to look at that is to take the story of Jesus walking on the water. Now, it's a funny little story, because and the only time I ever hear about it today is when somebody's telling a bad golf joke. That's the only time we don't preach on things like Jesus <laughs> walking on the water, because we don't know what to make of it. Uh, people cannot walk on water, and if you... If you think they can, you live in a world that is quite different from the world that we've lived in since the 17th century when Isaac Newton did his work. So what does this story mean? Well, if you go back into the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll discover that God's power over water is a dominant theme in Jewish worship, and it comes out of whatever the Red Sea experience was. And so the Jewish psalmist and the Jewish prophets begin to talk about how God has power over water, that God's footprints can be seen upon the deep and that God can make a pathway for God's self in the, in the sea. And if you, in the first century, believe that you've met a presence of the living God in this person named Jesus of Nazareth, the way you interpret that is you take all this God language out of the Jewish tradition and, and, and you apply it to Jesus. So a God who can make a pathway for God's self in the deep, a God whose footprints can be seen on the water, gets told as the story of Jesus being able to walk on the water. The Jews would have recognized what that was all about. It's later Gentiles that treat everything either literally or historically that don't understand how the Jewish people write their own sacred story. And so that creates the, the terrible problem that we face as contemporary Christians is that Christianity is divided in this country into, into very conservative fundamentalists who take the Bible quite literally and secular humanists who say, that just doesn't make any sense to me at all, and so I won't, I'm not going to be part of any religious tradition. And I think both of them are, are sadly uh, lost in trying to understand what the biblical story was all about. Uh, what we've done to other religions, what we've done to women, comes out of dreadful text in the Bible. What well, homosexuality, children, certainly. It's, you know, you over, over and over again, and, and I think it's time that we... We take the stained glass uh, covers off the Bible and say, there's some dreadful things in this book. And people say, well, why do you continue to read it? Well, because the Bible keeps transcending itself. The tribal God that wants to kill the firstborn in every Egyptian household and wants to stop the sun in the sky so that Joshua can kill more Amorites finally develops into a perception of God that says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, God's name will be great among the Gentiles, and in every nation incense shall be offered. And finally you get to Jesus of Nazareth, who says, if you really want to be fully human, you've got to even love your enemies. You've got to bless those who persecute you. 
that's an evolving God concept in the biblical story. And I think we need to be aware of where we've come from, and I think we need to be aware of where we must go in the religious field. So the Bible, to me, is a terribly important part of my tradition. But I don't want to have it read the way the Jerry Falwells of the world read it to justify any evil that they want to do to anybody. Tom Harper is the author of The Pagan Christ, Recovering the Lost Light, and not only argues strongly against the literalist biblical interpretations of today, as did Bishop John Shelby Spong on a recent program, but he argues strongly that the evidence is overwhelming that Jesus Christ was never actually on earth as a literal man. Now, because of the controversial nature of these claims, and because we entertain only guests promoting well-reasoned, evidence-driven, certainly to the degree available, and intellectually honest arguments, not nut jobs, I thought it was all the more important that I give you some of the highlights of Tom Harper's credentials and achievements before we begin. Uh, Tom won several scholarships at the University of Toronto, including the Jarvis Scholarship in Greek and Latin, the Maurice Hutton Scholarship in Classics, as well as the Sir William Mulock and the Gold Medal in Classics. Uh, He attended Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship from 51 to 54, began a career as an Anglican priest at St. Margaret's in the Pines in West Hill, Ontario from 1957 to 64. Later, he was a professor of the New Testament at the University of Toronto, Toronto School of Theology from 64 to 71. He's a fellow of the Religious Public Relations Council here in the U.S., was awarded the Silver Medal for Outstanding Journalism by the State of Israel in 1976. He is listed in the most recent edition of Men of Achievement in Cambridge, England. He's authored over 19 books, including eight Canadian bestsellers. Most recently, I should add, he has published Living Waters, Selected Writings on Spirituality. Today, Tom Harper is perhaps Canada's best-known spiritual author, journalist, and TV host. Tom was a journalist at the Toronto Star, covering ethics, spirituality, and religion for over 30 years, and was religion editor for the Toronto Star for over a decade. In fact, it could be because of all this achievement that his conclusions of late in his 2004 book, The Pagan Christ, are so troubling to some. Now, to hear about all this, I want to extend a warm welcome to Tom Harper. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Delighted to have you here. I have so many questions for you, uh, but I guess in in terms of where to begin, why don't we start with kind of letting you state your proposition that, uh, in your opinion, Jesus Christ is, in fact, a mythical character. Yes, and and this... um Uh, has come as a result of considerable research and a good deal of heart-searching and thinking as well. I don't think that anybody can prove a negative in this area. That is to say, I cannot prove that there never was a historical Jesus. But I've come to realize that the evidence that has been uh, put forward for his um, uh, historicity is flimsy in the extreme. Um, the critic, uh, the American critic Harold Bloom, in his recent book, Yahweh and Jesus, The Names Divine, he um, says with great uh, strength and, and backing, I think, th- that uh, th- he doesn't recommend anybody go into the search for the historical Jesus as a career nowadays because the, there is just simply the evidence is not there. And uh, uh, he wonders, as I do, at many of the scholars who have sifted the scriptures um, so thoroughly they've ground them up into fine dust almost, um, trying to get back to what they think would be the core Jesus. He marvels at the fact that even though they they destroy all all the things that might be considered um, uh, somehow evidence for his existence, they destroy it with their criticism and then nevertheless somehow miraculously cling to the belief that, nevertheless, there was a historical person behind it all. And anyway, that's that's what happened with me. I looked at the evidence from the first century. The only evidence there is is that of Josephus, who was a wonderful writer and a nonstop liar. And the, uh, the passage that in Josephus that uh, everybody leans on heavily 
could not have been written by him because he was um, a, um, a pensioner of the Flavians, of the Roman Fla- house of, of the Flavians. Um, he wanted more than anything to please his Roman masters, and he hated, above all things, Jewish Messiah figures who would lead, as in fact happened, his people into ruinous conflict with Rome. So the idea that he wrote this passage is, is to my mind, ludicrous, and the fact that it's never quoted by any early author in the church until the 4th century by Eusebius, who again was a man who played fast and loose with the truth, um, shows that that it wasn't around until it was um, uh, invented and inserted into the text. And I think most people, if you if you you just suddenly sprang the question on them, would say, of course, there is a historical Jesus. But many people would say, yes, there is a devil, um, um, with with just the equal assurance and uh, the, the evidence for the. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're into Never Never Land, but it was a world in which sacred truth was told in a particular way. It was told mainly by means of myth. Now, when modern people hear the word myth, they immediately um, equate it with untruth, right. with fairy tale, with, um, um, with falsehood. Right. But for the ancients, this was not the case. I mean, beginning with Plato and right down into the, the uh, era when the Christian church was forming, truth was... Uh, truth that was eternal, that was ab- abiding, truth that really revealed the the, the deepest um, authenticities of life was told by means of a story, by means of a myth. Uh, they regarded myth as the vehicle, in fact, the most sacred vehicle for conveying um, truth. They thought they thought of history as interesting. But as passing, which indeed it is, uh, one darn thing after another, as has been said, they distrusted history because it was, as they say, fleeting. Um, you take um, our modern era when, when the President Kennedy was shot in Dallas. There were television cameras, there were other cameras, there were thousands of people watching and then on television Nobody knows for sure until this day exactly what happened. And then there's the larger question of what was the meaning of that event. The myth is what carries the meaning of history. So those who who talk about myths and untruths, in your opinion, are missing a significant piece of the significance. Well, I think they they will never understand what any sacred literature, and I don't care what religion you're looking at, what any sacred literature is saying, if you do not understand myth, and if you don't understand metaphor and imagery of that kind, you will never know what it really is talking about. All you'll be dealing with is the surface, what St. Paul called the letter that kills, as opposed to the spirit which gives life. There were many, uh, we now know because of the uh, of the Gnostic uh, library that was discovered at Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt in 1945, and uh, the results of which are still coming coming out, like the Gospel of Judas recently. Um, we know from that, as well as from many, many other sources, that there were all kinds of different isms, if you like. Uh, the old picture that I was given when I was training for the priesthood of the Anglican or Episcopal Church was that it was a continuous, simple process of of growth, and there was one Christianity from the beginning. In fact, there were romantic ideas. Let's get back to the undivided church of the first century. Well, there was never such an animal. Um, it was, there, there were many Christianities. In fact, they're referred to them now as lost Christianities because... As one orthodoxy took over, particularly after Constantine came on board and the the, uh, the empire, the weight of empire was thrown behind the, the one party, the orthodox 
party. Sure, because they'd uh, kill you if you were pagan, correct? Yeah, then, then everybody, uh, all the rest was pagan if they didn't, didn't agree with that. That's, that's the other um, strand in the argument. The first argument is that if you look at the evidence, and of course I just looked at Josephus, and there are many other um, authors that are quoted, all of them, incidentally, from the second century, not, not nobody else from the first. Um, and each, in each case, their evidence is extraordinarily ambiguous. I mean, it just doesn't, it's not enough to rest the case for a great religion on. But uh, the, other, that the other strand was the fact that when I examined the Egyptian mythology, especially the Isis, Horus, the Osiris and Horus and Isis, that trilogy, that, the, the three of them, once I looked at that and looked at it in detail, I realized the similarity, similarities were far too great to be accidental or to be um, just mere sort of shadow parallels. They, they were, in many cases, identical. And uh, things that I had heard or I'd read, for example, Carl Jung, in, in one of his books, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, I think it is, says that the, the, Hor- the Horus, um, Osiris Horus myth was the basis and uh, gave its name uh, in sense of content to the whole Christian movement. And Joseph Campbell, I found, saying the same thing. Well, I, f- I found other authors who had researched this more thoroughly who, who gave the exact parallels, and it was just astonishing to me. And can so can it, you give us me, some of those? Because to a lot of people this is new, that the concept of salvation or rising... Uh, rising after death, uh, what, what are the parallels? Well, the parallels are very widespread in the ancient Mediterranean world, actually. I mean, it's not just Horus. Uh, Horus and Jesus, I think. Um, um, the uh, scholar Gerald Massey in England found uh, over 200 close correspondences between Horus and Jesus. But, but it the the rising uh, the dying and rising god was a phenomenon of the ancient mediterranean world and and it was um, not just egyptian i mean uh, although egypt was the mother i think of all um, all else that flowed uh, there in a religious sense okay. uh, it, nevertheless you had adonis you had um, dionysus you had um, all kinds of dying and rising gods. And I know the critics of my theory will say, well, there are correspondences, but they're not exact. You don't need exact correspondences. I mean, when you look at the overall picture, it, it's just, it just it can't be an accident that here we now have in Jewish dress what was essentially uh, a myth or a story of meaning that was being told by many other different um, parts of, of the country in Greece and, and elsewhere. St. Augustine got the doctrine, uh, the way, the means to express the doctrine of the Trinity from, uh, really from Plotinus and from the Neoplatonists. Um, uh, he, that, that there are trinities in Egyptian theology uh, there, in their in their theo- which was very sophisticated, by the way, um, in Egyptian theology, which is emanational, that is to say, from the one Father God, other divinities flow. There, there was one source. There were several notable um, trinities, and of course, in Hinduism or Ved- in the Vedic religion, you have trinities as well. So the Trinitarian thought is not all that unique, really. Well, there, there's a lot of disinform- misinformation. You're, you're, quite, you're quite right, but um, Mithras' birthday was in fact celebrated on the 25th of uh, December, as was the birthday of the other gods. I mean, there was celebrated, but not documented. To, I mean, oh, not documented as that's when he right. Okay, yeah, he wasn't born. No, because right. you see, the meaning of his birth is nothing to do with history. Um, it's mythological, right? Exactly, and, it, and it's tied in to as paganism was. It's tied into the cosmos and to the universe. It, it's the twenty fifth of December because it's three days after the solstice, right? And that's the significance of the of the birth, and that's why the birth of Jesus was moved 
uh, originally it was thought to have been March 25th. It was moved to December 25th to come into harmony with um, Mithras and, and the other, other deities who were celebrated. But that has nothing to do with history at all. But neither does, the, for example, the date of Easter. It's interesting, you know, that the churches today, when do they celebrate Easter? It's not on the same date every year. Why not? Because Easter can only happen after the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox has to happen first. Then there has to be a full moon, which generally comes around the same time. Interesting. And after the full moon, the first Sunday, that's Easter. So Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. What's got that got to do with history or with Jesus of Nazareth? It has nothing to do with that, but it has everything to do with the way nature works and with, with the pagan mind. And I'll tell you, it developed like this. At first, when the pagans said to the Christian apologists of the early centuries, well, you're just saying what, what, what we, we have said in our mythologies, uh, uh, the Christians responded with, well, yes, that's, that's right, so you shouldn't have any trouble. Whether you have virgin birth, we have virgin birth. Uh, but then they realized that wasn't very satisfactory. And so they came along with a second line of argument, and that was that these mythological elements that were found in um, the, the cult of Bacchus or whatever, Mithras, whatever, that they had been planted there by the devil. And they actually argue that the devil planted them there uh, to sort of to confuse the minds of uh, Christians later on. And, and so they decided... Uh, well, we're not going to deal with this by argument anymore. We're going to deal with it by burning their books and by hounding them out of existence. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened once they had power. Now, was that brought on by Constantine, essentially? It's in the wake of Constantine, because to do it, they had to have the power yes. of Rome. Before that, they were persecuted themselves, but, but they became very good at persecuting um, once they were um, vested with the power to do so. Well, let's take the negative argument first. Let's say, here we know of the man who was responsible for one-third of the New Testament or more. He's the earliest writer in the New Testament by at least 20 years. Uh, he never met a historical Jesus, but he had an experience of some kind, right. a mystical experience. And let, let's, let's, see, let's look at this. Here he is, and he's propagating this, this, this uh, gospel, he never mentions the empty tomb. He never mentions the virgin birth. He never mentions the Sermon on the Mount. He never mentions the Lord's Prayer. He never mentions a single teaching of Jesus except one uh, where he says it's more blessed to give than to receive, which is not in the Gospels. It's, it's in the book of Acts. And, uh, and uh, the verses that he recites about the institution of the Lord's Supper. But that, he says, was given to him, quote, by revelation. And when we compare the parallels in other um, religions of the time, was a kind of a formula, and I personally do not take that as evidence of any history. So you could go, I could go on and on sure. about the extraordinary silences in Paul at points where it would have helped him if he had... <clears throat> For example, in Romans chapter 8, he's talking about prayer. And he said, we don't know how to pray. We, we pray with groanings that can't be uttered. <clears throat> he never mentions the fact that there was a Lord's Prayer. He doesn't know anything, he doesn't know anything about that. So, oh, and the other, just one other thing in that connection. He never, ever, out of all the times he mentions Jesus Christ, and he mentions Jesus Christ about 200 times, he never says Jesus of Nazareth. Not once. Okay, now, what about the references that are there, and, and there are some, which suggest maybe there was a historical Jesus? One of them is where he speaks of him as born of a woman. And the, the, um, the apologists pounce on this and say, there you see, but, but Osiris was born of a woman. I mean, certainly Horus was born of a woman. Most of the the images of the mother and child from that period are really Isis with Horus on her knee. And the black Madonnas of Europe, I think there are about 40 of them, 
uh, that have survived, they were all originally um, um, Isis and Horus and uh, had to be rebaptized, if you like, into Mary and Jesus. So uh, anyway, he do, it's not enough to say that he was born of a woman. Um, it says also, Paul says, he was born under the law. Well, that, uh, and that he somehow came from the house of David. That was formulaic. In other words, the expectation was that to, to be Messiah would be to be born under the law, just like Jesus had to be born at Bethlehem because Messiah had to be born from <clears throat> the place where David um, was born. So uh, when you look at the references that he makes, they're very slim, and they are, in actual fact, references to a mythical Jesus on another plane altogether. When he talks about the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, and he's not very specific, he says nothing about place or the trials or anything like that, he's talking about something that happened on another plane altogether than this plane. He was Gnostic, you know, and, and in my view, and the Gnostics believed that anything that was significant said to happen on the earthly plane actually took place in the spiritual heavens above, in the Pleroma. That was where reality, as Plato had said, that's where reality was to be found. Um, so earthly happenings were um, simply counterparts or simply reflections, if you like, of that. There has been a great deal, and I'm sorry to say, um, uh, not just of criticism, because one expects that, but of venom uh, as well. And they will do, some people will do anything to destroy your credibility if they can. You attack your sources, attack your footnotes, attack, <laughs> um, attack anything they, they can. But, you know, all, the overwhelming response has been so positive. I have hundreds and hundreds upon hundreds of emails from people who have said, I felt what a relief, what a sense of liberation, because we haven't talked yet about the central thrust of my book, The Pagan Christ. It's not about proving that or, or showing that there was no historic Jesus. Yes. That is really incidental to the argument. The main thrust of the book is that this story that has been told so many ways, so many times, has a meaning for me and has a meaning for you and I believe for everyone because basically what it's saying in its simplest form is that each one of us has divinity within ourselves. We are incarnate. That Jesus is supposed to have been God and man. Well, we are God and man. We're not God in the absolute sense. Uh, any more than I'm the sun because I have sunshine in my in, 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 coursing through my my body, uh, but but the sun is very much part of our physical makeup, and uh, uh, one could go on and I could describe that. But uh, we have the same divine incarnation in our own being. What came as a revelation to me was that the single most important datum of all religious myth, metaphor, similes, and whatever, is the truth that of incarnation, that God has become incarnate in the human being. We are all of us offspring of the Most High. Now, that's in the New Testament, but it's been ignored. One of the problems with um, evangelicalism in North American um, religious life today is that it, it involves almost up to the hilt, magical thinking. And I, I, I think that is, uh, uh, holds us back in our evolution as human beings. But I think that Sam Harris, uh, it, he's right on one thing and he's wrong on another, in my view. He's right that there is a demonic shadow side to religion. Bishop Spong would agree with that. I certainly feel that that is true. And you have to look at it. And nobody can read my account in the pagan Christ of the shadow side of the 3rd and 4th centuries and not see just how horrible that was at that, at, at that point. But I don't want to throw the whole thing out because uh, uh, we're throwing out something infinitely precious if we do. That's baby in bathwater, that, that routine. Uh, that would be a, a terrible mistake. Where he comes closer to the truth um, in a positive way, it seems to me, 
is where he says, God forbid it should ever happen. I'm paraphrasing. God forbid it should ever happen, but if the earth were to be reduced to a cinder or to a dead planet through human warfare, nuclear holocaust, whatever, one day, it will not be so much because of political theories or whatever. It will be because of words written in sacred texts that were taken literally. And he's absolutely right. If you take the myth and you insist that it's literal, you will end either in ridicule on the one hand or in, um, in dangerous um, destruction on the other. I'm talking about, um, yes, a, mystica, a mystical belief, if you like to call it that, which um, is very much at one uh, with the mysticism of uh, the East, if it's properly understood and not in, uh, in its distorted forms. Not in Madonna's form. No, that's right, yeah. <laughs> we, we have it all distorted for us, and straw men are built, and then they tear them apart. But if you read the Bhagavad Gita, if you read the Upanishads, you will find that they are talking about this reality that I'm talking about, uh, and that Joseph Campbell, for example, talked about, that that the secret of life, the mystery of life, is is within us, and it has been planted there by God. And we are meant to find that. And I, I would never, ever... That's why my book is a book of hope. I would never, ever surrender to that, that because I believe our salvation um, ultimately <clears throat> lies in finding out who we really are. As Plato put it, remembering who we really are, where we have come from. We have come from the light. We are here for a short time, living in a physical body and experience, growing in experience and so on. But ultimately, we are destined again to return to that light and that to me is uh, transforms all the rest of life it makes it makes it very wonderful and i never want to throw that out um, even though i'm aware as sam harris is of the great dangers um, that religion poses in the world today this concludes part one of the accidental atheist how i got here and how you can help in appeal for mercy Please proceed to part two.